and are proud are proud to claim Lucy Jane Bledsoe as a native daughter, even though she left us for sunnier climes, California. Um, when we were considering what kind of program we should be offering to honor the 50th anniversary of Title IX, my co-PVP, Bev, saw Lucy's presentation to the Santa Clara, California branch and suggested that I see the video as well. I was as impressed as Bev was, and we were delighted when Lucy agreed to share her very relevant story with Oregon Online Branch. Lucy's Lava Falls won the 2019 Devil's Kitchen Fiction Award. Her 2018 novel, The Evolution of Love, was a finalist for the Pharaoh Grumley Award for Fiction and the Lambda Literary Award. She's the author of an earlier collection of short stories, <clears throat> a collection of narrative nonfiction, and five other novels. She's received a Yaddo Fellowship, a California Arts Council Fellowship, and two National Science Foundation Artists and Writers Fellowships. And her writing has won the Saturday Evening Post Great American Fiction Award. As Arts and Letters Prize for Fiction, a Sherwood Anderson Foundation Fiction Award. Oh my goodness, this goes on. <laughs> and, and wonderful. And two Pushcart Prize nominations and an American Library Association Stonewall Book Award. Her stories have been translated into Japanese, Spanish, German, Dutch, and Chinese. Lucy has traveled to Antarctica three times, twice as the recipient of National Science Foundation fellowships, and once as a guest of the, on the Russian research ship, the Akademik Sergei Babilov. She's one of a tiny handful of people who have stayed at all three American stations in Antarctica. And she's also stayed in a number of field camps, both on the coast and in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, where scientists are studying penguins, climate change, and the Big Bang. As a social justice activist, Lucy is currently working on voting rights. Georgia will post a link to her website in the chat so you can see Lucy's amazing array of <laughs> interests and experiences. This evening, we'll hear Lucy tell her personal story of her fight for Title IX as a student at Wilson High School in Portland. This amazing effort is portrayed in a slightly fictional, fictionalized form in her novel, No Stopping Us Now, which you can see the cover of behind Bev. This amazing effort is, yes, <laughs> and it's a truly compelling story. I, I read it and I was just, I was just blown away. Forward Reviews calls it a timeless and triumphant story of courage in the face of opposition, as well as a glimpse into the early days of Title IX's implementation. No Stopping Us Now is an excellent historical novel. So everyone, please welcome Lucy Jane Bledsoe. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Pat. And thank you, Bev and Pat. And I'm not sure who else was involved in organizing this, but I'm so honored to be speaking uh, to the Oregon chapter of the AAUW because I am an Oregonian and I never meant to move to California, but it happened. And I travel back up to Oregon all the time. I, it's my favorite state, I love it there. So it's really a, a joy for me to be meeting with you all. Um, as you all know, June 23rd, which is just what, two weeks or so from now is the 50th anniversary of Title IX, which is kind of um, one thing that's a little shocking to me about this story of mine is that I apparently am now history. <laughs> it's a little hard to get used to that. But um, I did write this um, I, book. I wrote it um, as a novel. I can talk a little later about why I fictionalized it. Um, I think one reason it took me so long to tell this story as a writer who's, who's told many stories is because I thought I should tell it as nonfiction. Um, and I eventually came around to wanting to write it for a young audience, although I'm having lots of folks my own age read it, um, because I wanted to continue um, or, or, or foster a conversation between people who, um, who teens now and older women about how to 
continue doing work on, on social, um, especially uh, gender justice, justice issues. Um, I think there's, you know, it's always difficult talking between generations, um, but especially right now, I think we have some really different views. So I've been doing a lot of really fun events where I'm in conversation with uh, high school students. Um, and I've done several of those that have been really fun and just talking about our different views of um, feminism and social justice and anyway, so that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Um, it is about 90% true. Really what's nonfiction about it is just shuffling some of the timelines to make it a better story. If I wrote it as nonfiction, it would be too many meetings and testifying and, and I wanted to get more of a personal story in there. So I'm just gonna share a little bit of the story. I'm gonna read just a few short bits and, and tell you a little bit about the story, talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then uh, look forward to any questions you have um, or comments. Um, so I think I'm gonna start this time by just reading the first page and a half from the beginning of the very first page and a half to set the stage. So this takes place in Portland, Oregon and I'm 17 years old in this story. When my alarm goes off at 5.30 a.m., I wake up hugging my basketball. I let my fingers feel the nubbly surface, the indented lines, the comforting roundness. I imagine all of that spinning off my fingers and heading for the hoop, the nearly silent swish of the ball falling through the net. Basketball is the correction to all things askew. It's like traveling to the secret universe in the deepest part of yourself where the thinking just stops and my muscles and bones and blood take over. It's the one place where I can forget everything else. I need that badly this morning. I roll out of bed, pull on sweats and stuff my school clothes and transistor radio into my backpack. Before going out the front door, I take a good long look at myself in the hall mirror. Tall with a tangle of short blonde curly hair and serious gray eyes, I wish I looked more striking. I don't know what my style is. My best friend Carly once said I should aim for bohemian, which I didn't really appreciate since the implication was that wild child was the best I could hope for. She said that wasn't what she meant, but this morning I definitely feel shaggy. If I can just stay focused on the team, on our game tomorrow, then maybe I can survive the day. I leave the house well before dawn, walk up the street and then into the woods, my shortcut to school. I've walked this route hundreds of times, could possibly do it with my eyes closed, but this morning, everything is making me uneasy. The creek gurgling beside the trail, something scampering in the nearby brush, even the nonstop rain. I was an idiot at the party on Saturday night and can't bear the thought of seeing Steve in school today. But what I'm feeling goes deeper than worrying about that. A profound uncertainty, something between dread and hope is lodged in my chest. It's 1974 and the American president is a crook. I'm stuck in soggy Portland, Oregon for the unforeseeable future, 17 years old in the middle of my junior year. I'm hardly a kid anymore and yet I have plenty of high school left to go. My three older siblings have all moved out already and their being gone gives me a sense of velocity, like everything is moving forward too fast. It's like I'm hurtling towards a cliff and maybe that's a good thing, a launch and a flight, or maybe it's a bad thing, an impending crash into the bottom of a canyon. So that sets a little bit of the emotional stage uh, for where this character, myself, was then. Um, I grew up in a big family. That, there were five of us kids, and both my parents were in the home. We were a very athletic family. Um, my grandfather was a football coach um, by occupation, and my dad would throw us all in the car in the summers, and we'd go to these city track meets, and, and um, I loved sports. And my brothers, of course, well, not of course, but my brothers played baseball, basketball, and football. Um, when I was in high school, all that was available was tennis and golf and swimming. Um, and my brothers had taught me basketball. They, they loved being coaches and I loved being coaching, being coached. So I was dying to play basketball, but um, there was no team. Um, so I played tennis and I ended up getting my uh, letter in tennis. You know, that's when you, I don't know, you win a certain number of matches or you play a certain number of hours. I can't remember what qualifies you for a letter. And there was a club called the Letterman's Club. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to join the Letterman's Club because I got my letter in tennis. I knew, of course, that the Letterman's Club was all boys, but I went anyway and walked into this room after school one day and then the teacher advisor there in this room full of boys and said, you know, I have my letter, so I want to be in the Letterman's Club. And I sat there while they had a whole long conversation about, you know, how this was impossible. The main argument I remember is one of the boys saying, well, but it's called the Letterman's Club. What would we call it if a girl was in it? Um, so that didn't 
end well, um, but I accepted it and walked out. And I, I think that's um, where I got the invitation uh, for the next thing that happens a few weeks later. Uh, my vice, one of the vice principals at the school, a woman named Mrs. Martin called me down to her office. Um, oh, I, I, did, oh, I wanted to say one more thing. I, the, the, because it might be confusing. Um, the basketball game that you heard me reading about, I had um, organized a group of girls to play in a city rec league. So we were playing in the city. Um, the principal at my high school allowed us to use the gym from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. So we'd get up every morning and practice from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and somehow find transportation to these games in, in the city rec league. So that's, that's that. Um, but we had no uniforms, no coach. Uh, if a group of boys showed up early for school and wanted to use the gym, we were pushed off it. It was, it was a rough situation. Anyway, so Mrs. Martin, this principal, calls me to her office, and I'm going to read a little bit from, from that scene. This is just one page. The secretary waves me through to Mrs. O in the book I call her, I forgot, her real name is Mrs. Martin, I call her Mrs. Hodge in the, in the uh, book. Uh, the secretary waves me through to Mrs. Hodge's lair. I step up to the front of her desk and she makes me wait while she finishes writing something on a big yellow legal pad. People make fun of Mrs. Hodge with her stiff hairdo, rhinestone studded cat eye glasses and bright red lipstick, but I like her. She's acerbic and always gets right to the point. Don't bother sitting, she finally says, not looking up from her legal pad. This will be brief. Gloria Steinem is coming to speak at the Civic Auditorium in a couple of weeks. She wants a youth representative on stage with her. Mrs. Hodge pushes a piece of paper across the desk at me. The particulars are right here. It takes me a few seconds to take in that I'm not in trouble, that my grandpa isn't lost or hurt. What she has said is kind of crazy though. Me, I ask. Speak to your parents, she says. Let me know tomorrow. Gloria Steinem, I say, the Gloria Steinem? Mrs. Hodge finally looks up at me, the pencil gripped in her right hand. I stand facing her, my basketball balanced on one hip and the fingertips of my other hand on my chest in a gesture of incredulity. No, Mrs. Hodge says in a deadpan voice, an Avon sales lady who shares the same name. Nodding, I start backing out of the office. Mrs. Hodge actually smiles then. That was you, she says. Wasn't it, who wrote a letter to the administration at the beginning of the year insisting that girls who lettered be admitted to the Letterman's Club? So that started me on quite a journey. Um, I did the event with Gloria Steinem. It was terrifying. The Portland Civic Auditorium holds about, I think it's about 3,000 people. Um, and there I was on stage with her at 17 years old. Um, I didn't know what I should say. And I asked my mom before the event. And my mom, who um, would have loved to have had a career actually, and she will admit this, but didn't uh, because she didn't think she should and she had these five kids, told me to say to this audience of 3000 feminists that um, it, I think it's perfectly okay um, to be a housewife, which I did believe and do believe it's a perfectly honorable thing to do, but it wasn't the, um, it didn't get a big re reaction from this particular crowd. And so I was, got this very tepid applause, but eventually I got around to saying how much I wanted to play basketball and there was no basketball um, program in the Portland public schools. Um, and this is what I learned about Title IX. Title IX was just two years old at this point. And Gloria Steinem and, and others in the audience let me know that this law, you, as you all know, um, said I had the right to any opportunities that boys in the high school had. Um, so that was kind of amazing to learn. I think probably the biggest lesson of that whole uh, uh, event though, was meeting Gloria Steinem herself, who was funny, kind, calm, reasonable, smart. I just, she just impressed me so much and she was so different from how the media her portrayed her. And indeed I got up the next morning and read the Portland Oregonian and my poor little naive 17 year old self was shocked by how they described this event. This is a direct quote. Um, Present in the audience, wrote this reporter, were the usual lunatics and bra burners. And they described Gloria Steinem as like a complete nutcase. And I, I was just like, I was just amazed. They said, put things in her mouth that she hadn't said. So it was quite, I, I, it was my first glimpse of the blowback uh, that happens when you try to make change. Um, I did meet some women though, who, um, older women who, one was a teacher at my school said, Hey, you want to, you want to work on this basketball thing? So they started driving me down to the legislature in Salem where I testified there. And I started testifying to the school board. Um, 
the blowback again shocked poor little naive me. Um, I I couldn't. I, they started letters started flying around the city from the school board to my principal, from my principal back to the school board, the athletic director, letters to the editor of the Oregonian. Many of them outright calling me a liar and calling me all kinds of things. When what I had said was there is no girls program basketball program in the Portland Public High Schools and there is a boys one so how that can be a lie it's sort of a factual thing luckily I kept I like to show this I kept a scrapbook at the time that's very tattered now but I have this scrapbook where I kept all these letters and all the documents and things that happened um, which was very helpful in writing this book and I just want to read you three very very short quotes from some of these letters um, Remember, this is this one. This is 1974. This one is from the athletic director of my high school to my principal, and he's very defensive about the things I had said to the school board about what was going on. One of the things I testified about was that I had this um, city league basketball team that was practicing in the wee hours of the morning, and boys sometimes came and kicked us off the court, and, and the principal wouldn't enforce that we had reserved the gym. So what this, my athletic director writes at the end of this letter says, Ms. Bledsoe's statement that male athletes are sanctioned and privileged and given exclusive rights to official facilities is totally and unequivocally preposterous and unfounded. <laughs> so that, here's another letter um, from the same guy um, to also to my principal. And this is one of my favorite quotes in these letters. It's, it's, these are 50, 50 year old letters. At the end of this letter, he says, I sincerely believe that if Ms. Bledsoe has any quarrel with the overall athletic program at the high school, it should be directed more toward getting more girls involved, not toward getting the athletic department involved. So <laughs> the next time I went and testified to the school board meeting, I asked, how can more girls get involved in programs that do not exist? Um, one more quote, uh, and this, you know, the, the, these were actually pretty painful at, at the time. They're funny now. Um, this is from a guy who's worked for the, uh, uh, the school board. He was called the Public Information Department. Sounds kind of Orwellian. Um, he was one of the guys who took notes when I would testify and made all kinds of errors, the same kind of errors that I saw that they made for Gloria Stein. For instance, when I testified at the school board, everyone else said their quotes and when he would do a quote for me, you know, he says, blood so alleged <laughs> was the verb he always used for what I said. But his last sentence in this, to my principal, how to deal with me, the entire letter refers to me as the girl. My name is never mentioned. And he ends it by saying, my last suggestion would be that you refute the girl and defend your high school at the next meeting of the committee. So now where did I put my notes? Here they are. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a pretty intense time. Um, I wrote letters back to the Oregonian. I wrote this, went back to the school board and tried to correct things when I was misquoted. The scariest part, though, were the personal attacks. Um, and it's sort of, again, shocking now, 50 years later, this happened. But the boys' basketball coach um, found me in a hallway at school one day and literally pushed me against a wall and told me if I didn't zip it, I would be very sorry. Um, a direct threat. Um, I guess now we would see that as sexual harassment. At the time, I told no one. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my parents. I just thought that was acceptable behavior. Um, several other coaches in my high school um, also told me that I had better shut up or I'd be sorry. Uh, my best friend at the time was a boy on the boys' basketball team. And this, uh, the boys' basketball coach told the whole boys' basketball team very disparaging things about me and asked them to spread it. Um, one thing that's taken me so long to write this book is is trying to come to terms with the anger and what was so threatening about this. And I guess I have more answers about that now at 65 than I did at 17, but um, it, was, it was a lot for a 17 year old girl to take in. Um, but I do wanna read uh, one, one last section here. Um, So this is this, this time when the coaches are all sort of personally coming up to me and, and saying things like that. Then, as if things couldn't get worse, they do. I'm leaving the admin offices trying to figure out how I explain my tardiness to Mr. Murray. And here in the empty hallway, plodding slowly my way, comes Mr. Stanton, AKA Coach Stanton, head of the football team, his eyes pinned on me. I'm completely alone with him. I glance around for an escape route, but see nothing but the long rows of metal lockers on either side of me. 
Their grave verticality morphs for a second into prison bars, making me think of the suffragettes, how they were thrown in jail for wanting the simple right to vote, how they were manacled to the prison bars, and some were even beaten. I'm only 17 years old, I want to scream, leave me alone. As Coach Stanton draws closer, I look straight ahead, as if by not looking at him, I might be able to ward off the attack. When we are side by side, him going in one direction and me in the other, I think maybe I'll get off free. Just keep walking, I tell myself, just keep breathing, if I can find any oxygen at all in the rank hallway. What's even left for Coach Stanton to say or do? Mr. Void and Coach Ward have already taken care of the problem of me. I'm toast, I'm a known liar, but no, Coach Stanton makes a U-turn, slings an arm across my shoulders and walks wordlessly with me down the hall. Physically, I'm about to collapse under his big arm. Mentally, his total silence wrecks me. I wanna scream, you won, okay, you won, get off of me. After about 30 yards of this side-by-side -side promenade with me aiming for the exit to the outside where with any luck, I'll be able to breathe and walk freely, he says, did you say hi to your brothers for me? Uh, I remember he'd asked me to do that a long time ago on the day this all began. Hmm, he presses. Yes, I mean, I haven't talked to him in a while, but I will. Weak, but at least it was honest. Good, he says, I hope they're doing well. I nod, then squeak out, they are. Glad to hear it, he says, summer plans. Me or my brothers, you. I have a job with the county parks. Excellent, he says. We pace another five yards, and then he gives me a squeeze with the arm that's still around my shoulders. I could swear it's a friendly rather than hostile squeeze. When I look at him, his watery blue eyes are kind. He steps back and says, I'm with you all the way, girl. So I always tear up still all these years later when I remember that, that, uh, that alliance that I got from Mr. Stanton, the football coach. And he turns out to be an ally through the whole rest of the story. Um, it's one thing I like to talk about when I am addressing uh, young women who are trying to figure out how to um, deal with things today is look for the allies. Um, and it, it's a, I, I ended up having quite a few allies eventually, and those letters were flying around the city. Um, my representative in, uh, in, that, um, in Salem in Oregon sent a letter to the editor supporting me, and a lot of good stuff started happening, but it took a little bit of time. Um, so... I guess I just want to say that um, I, I didn't think of the book's title. I had another title and my uh, agent thought up the title. So I'm giving her credit. And I want to say that because I love the title now. And I love it because I think it addresses um, the history. It references that history, no stopping us now, but also reaches forward into the future. And it's, it's through those years I want to grasp at where we've been and where we're going. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. I've only told a little bit of the story. I don't want to give it all away. In fact, I'll put here in the chat, I think I can do this. Yeah. Um, if anyone's interested, there's a couple places you can get the book and, and read the rest, but I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on my story, on your Title IX stories, um, anything that you have to say. You'll have to unmute yourselves. Pat. Lucy, awesome story. Thank you so much. And of course, you're speaking to a bunch of women who never experienced competitive sports, mm -hmm. ever even had the thought. You know, when, when I was in high school at North Eugene High School, mm -hmm. um, we did gymnastics and a couple of other things, but they were never competitive. We did competitive track in junior high school, but, you know, not really. So, Love your story. Thank you. I'm going to get your book because this is such an important issue. My my boyfriends from high school say, oh, you and Judy would have been great athletes if only you. Yeah. Yeah. Had well, the one, chance. Yeah. One thing I tried to get across in this story, too, is and there have been studies that show this, that playing on teams, working cooperatively, excuse me, cooperatively um, towards common goals is a huge skill that helps people later in life. And it's something that girls didn't have in our generation. Um, so just making that connection between what team sports do just for the sheer joy of them at the time, but also the skills they give you for later in life is so important. 
Yeah, that reminds me so much. Um, I think, Lucy, first, I love the book. Oh, my gosh. There are parts I teared up, especially about your grandpa. Yeah. I mean, that just touched my heart. And I'm really like, oh, why, why am I tearing up? Well, that's why. So thank you. Thank you for that. But Carol Gilligan's book. I mean, we know the research that Dr. Gilligan has done with the fact of, you know, looking at how boys are brought up and how girls are brought up. And I'll never forget my daughter when she was little. She said, I don't want you. Know, we went to McDonald's before I was in a nutrition, right? <laughs> we went to McDonald's. She wanted a Big Mac or something. And they, they had certain uh, gender specific toys for the girls and the boys. And she says, Mom, I, I want the truck. And this is after I remember growing up with things like William's doll and everything that Marlo Thomas was, was dealing with. And that was part of my education and what I did as a teacher. But that's exactly what I did. And people would look at you like you're nuts. Like, what, doesn't she want, these are for the girls. No, she wants the truck. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. you know? yeah. So yeah, and, and I got to tell you one part of your book too that just reminded me something that went back was, I think this is on page 151. You're talking about, um, uh, this this whole idea about this girl looking like a 19th century girl who's taken the vapors pale and vacant oh, and yeah. you're going through that description all I could think about was something I read in college the yellow wallpaper by uh who was a Charlotte Perkins Gilman I had to go back to that because that's where it put me you yeah. thank you for getting me out of my head <laughs> in the book into someplace else I I thoroughly enjoyed your book I thoroughly enjoyed your story. Thank you so much for writing it and sharing it. No, well, thank you for saying all that. You know, when you talk about going back to that time period, one inter after the book, um, I had an editor, my agent sold it to a publisher, but the editor wanted me to make it a little more like 1974 and 1975. So I, you know, cause I had done it mostly from memory. So I started to, I actually went on Facebook and asked my friends, you know, tell me your favorite memories and fashions and thing from, things from 1974 and five. And it was very interesting because a lot of what people posted was inaccurate. You know, they're posting things from the 60s and, you know, just anything from the past. So that wasn't a very useful exercise, but it was kind of fun. But what I did do is I, I watched Soul Train from 1974. And I put a couple of those outfits that I saw on, in Soul, on Soul Train in, on my characters in this book, which was really fun. I watched All in the Family, if any of you remember that show. But I watched some TV from that era. And that was very helpful to me in, in getting just, some of the music and the and the clothes and, and getting the feel of that time. Am I supposed um, to call hey. people? <laughs> Nancy? I had to find my own mute. Um, I just wanted to share that um, I went to Wilson High School in Tacoma oh, and wow. um, I graduated in 1974. So we're we're almost and what I noticed then is that I would have played basketball had there been basketball. I played intramural basketball in junior high. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no coach, but we, we put a team together and we played other teams in the school. Um, and I played basketball in PE, but there was no, there were no, the only girls teams we had were um, swimming and um, water. What's the, 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 the water dancing, what's that called? Oh, oh synchronized nice. swimming. Synchronized swimming for girls, yeah. Um, that's what we had. And, and what I know is that when I was a senior, so in 1974, I knew of two gals who were sophomores who were playing basketball. I mean, basketball had come to, and they actually got scholarships um, when wow. they graduated. So, yeah. so it, it, it came into the high school just as I was leaving. It did just, well, that, that's because of Title IX. I played yeah. in college and I think there's a couple young women, I think two years younger than me, who at Cal were the first ever women to get scholarships for basketball. So it was just starting to happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. I was annoyed though, you know, just oh, two yeah. years too old, right? <laughs> Very frustrating, yeah. Any. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a different viewpoint. My, my children are both swimmers, and um, my son eventually was internationally ranked. But what happened with so many of the schools in bringing Title IX, they cut the boys' sports. We, he was a swimmer 
and they cut swimming and cut swimming and cut swimming from the different colleges. So his colleges he, he could go to and still compete kept getting eliminated. I don't think that was what Title IX was supposed to do is to eliminate boys sports so they could have this equality. But it, it really was difficult. My, my daughter, it was easy to find a school to swim at. The, at he went to Texas A&M and they have an 80 member girls equestrian team, which meant that they could have boys sports. But the boys on the swim team got partial to zero scholarships and the girls all got full rides. That isn't equal either. Well, but I'm I just sorry. want to share a different perspective. No, that's a very common perspective. I'm, I'm sorry that happened to your son. There've been a whole lot of studies about that and it's actually has not happened hardly anywhere. I, I know it's happened. It happened to your son, but it's been, that. that's one of the big arguments people raise against Title IX. Um, mainly that hasn't happened. The money hasn't come, been, I mean, a lot of people say that the money's being taken away from the boys and given to the girls. So I'm really sorry that happened to your sons because that isn't what's usually happened in most of the, the sports. Yeah, that sounds, sounds like there's a bad administrator who didn't know how to deal with it. No, I, I saw it repeatedly. Golf teams were cut, soccer teams were cut, swimming teams were cut for the boys. I can, and, and he graduated in 1999. From high school, and I can I can read you a long list of colleges that that dropped sports. So no, it it did happen. They wouldn't have dropped football or basketball. No, no, just well, the, what they call the minor sports. Minor yeah. sports. One of the yeah. myths that's been exploded with all the research that's been done is people say, well, you can't drop football because it's a big money maker. Actually. Um, most football programs do not make money. I mean, when you think about it, they have huge teams, they give huge scholarships. So this idea that football needs to be supported because it makes more money than the other sports is not even really true. There's an amazing um, book that just also came out called um, 37 Words by Sherry Boschert. And it's a history of Title IX. It's a nonfiction. It's, it's very readable, but it's, it's nonfiction. Um, and it goes over a lot of these issues in great detail. Dorothy, you had your hand up. Yeah, that that uh, that was a strategy of some colleges. I don't know about high school, but colleges, to in order to invest, you know, you say, well, we if we're going to have women's teams, then we're not going to be able to spend as much money on men's teams. So it was it was a sort of zero sum game strategy, and it pissed off the the, men, the wrestling community because they were one from the first ones to be cut. And there was a big lawsuit about it. I think today that would be a very difficult strategy to comply with Title IX to cut uh, men's teams in order to give some, money, some, some support to women's teams because it is not just equal money, it's what kinds of sports you got. But I wanted to say one thing about Tacoma, if you might. Uh, you, Nancy, you said you were there, and I, I live in Tacoma. Uh, when I first came here in the in late 2000s, uh, tens about 2010. Tacoma was um, had been uh, found out of compliance completely with Title IX, and they hired a coordinator to fix it up to to work on it. Jennifer Kubista and our, our Tacoma at UW branch got to know her somewhat, but she uh, she went in and dealt with the entire athletic issue, and and was able to put together. Com com complete com equality down in the middle school. So there's girls wrestling in the middle schools in Tacoma now because of that. And, and, and it's been a great, uh, uh, it's, it's a great addition. So uh, Title IX took, took them 10 years, but they finally did make some difference in that kind of thing because they were sort of not really complying. That's the trouble with that, with the whole sports thing is so big and so many schools it's easy to, if, you know, to get away with stuff for years and years and years. And Title IX was not enforced because uh, of many lawsuits against it for so long. But I think it's maybe, I don't know if, if Lucy would feel the same way. It is coming around a bit better now. It is coming around better. It's, there's still a lot of places that are not in compliance yet. Right. Um, what, sure. What's interesting, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I was more on the athletic part of it in the early years, but more and more Title IX is now being used 
in cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment. It's been much more used, you know, with making classrooms safe for um, young women and girls. So it's it's taken a whole nother direction lately. And and Sherry Boschert's book, 37 Wor Words, does deal with that, that transition too. But yeah, there, there's, it's probably a law that would never get passed today. <laughs> That's a thought, <laughs> Randa. Lucy, I'm just wondering if you've done an audio book yet of this. Um, let's see, where are they with that? I mean, the book just came out a couple months ago. I think, I, no, I haven't myself. Um, and I think they're coming out with one, but I don't think it's ready yet. Cats. So I just have to brag about Oregon AAUW because a couple of years ago, um, our, our lobbyist, <laughs> unpaid, our public policy person, Trish Garner, um, discovered that we the state only had a half-time person overseeing Title IX, one half-time person for the whole state. So we all lobbied to get two people <laughs> to oversee Title IX, and we were successful, but it was a huge effort, and two people probably still isn't enough, but can you imagine what a half-time person was able to do? Not much. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, Lucy, um, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but wh what do you see Currently, I mean, a lot of places, a lot of schools are out of compliance still. What do you see to be the biggest barrier to implementation of Title IX now? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I think something that was just mentioned a minute ago about um, it's really hard to, um, well, change is just really hard, but money, I guess. Um, and people don't want to change, you know, what's happening now. That's not a very good answer. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm stumped. How about, does anyone else have an answer to that? Sorry. I mean, what is the biggest barrier? It's a really good question because, I mean, one thing when I was young and working on this, it's like, it just seemed there's a law and fair is fair, equal is equal, but it's not as simple as that because it's very complex and they, there's a lot of talk about which programs are bringing in money, you know, as I was referencing, the football doesn't as much in many schools as they pretend it does. Um, I guess I would just say the biggest obstacle is just pure and simple sexism, actually. It's just really hard for uh, women to get 50% of anything, you know, it's just hard. Thank you. We have other questions? Well, let me, oh yes, Dorothy, sorry. I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to say, uh, it was it really it wasn't until I think uh, whenever there, there was a you could, it wasn't until the early 90s, I guess, that you could sue for money for non-compliance with Title IX. And that's been the most effective way to get compliance. Because once that's where the sexual harassment came in. Once they were suing and getting money from universities or colleges for the sexual harassment cases, they started clamping down on that because mm -hmm. they didn't want to have to pay money. And, and it, it, but it's such a expensive and you know, re way to try to enforce a law yeah. uh, by having it to be, go to court with, with lawyers and take years and years. AAUW financed a, a number, helped finance a number of cases for Title IX complainants in the old days anyway. But right. it's, uh, it's just that there's not enough oomph in Title IX to, to I mean, there's not enough authority in a Title IX system to enforce it. And without, it depends on self-enforcement and individuals complaining. And that's really very, very hit and miss. Uh, yeah, I think you make a really good point, Dorothy, that just the complexity of challenging uh, some situations that aren't in compliance is just so difficult. A lot of people don't want to take it on. I mean, I, I, uh, one thing I'm thinking of right now, and I know that the WNBA, the Women's Professional Basketball League, is not, of course, under Title IX because it's not a federally funded program, but I'm sure you've all heard they get paid a fraction of what the men in the NBA get paid. And it's the same question, you know, why is that? <laughs> why is that? Or the soccer league, the famous soccer league where the women win constantly and the men's soccer, American soccer team doesn't, and still the women were paid so much less. So the same question, like, why is there not equal pay there? 
it's it's hard question to answer because it just seems there's there's no good answer. Someone wrote here. Have, Betsy didn't help. Good good point. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions for Lucy? I have one that's completely off track, but I'm just dying to know the answer. Lucy, how did you get involved with Antarctica? Oh, yes. Well, you know, I think probably I, I write about a lot of different things, but I write a lot about um, out, the outdoors and human beings relationships to our environment. Um, I like to write about that a lot. A lot of my novels are about that. Um, I like to think a lot about how human beings are animals and we don't think of ourselves that way. So what does it mean to live in this relationship to this planet? And then I like to write stories about that. So I heard about um, this grant you could get from the National Science Foundation where artists and writers, full expenses paid trip to Antarctica um, from the National Science Foundation. And I so badly wanted to go to Antarctica just because it's just such a spectacularly extreme place. I like, to, I like to put my characters in extreme places and see what happens to them. So I applied for that grant, I got it. It was just one of the best experiences of my entire life. I love science. So I loved being in the field camps with the scientists, um, seeing what work they're doing, but also thinking about what my characters, as my, char my scientist characters, as it turns out, I wrote a novel called The Big Bang Symphony, which is about uh, three women who go and take jobs in Antarctica based on my travels there. So it was just a whole different uh, direction I went with that, that exploration. Thank you. Marty? Uh, another, I can't resist to ask this question. You, are you at all related to Drew Bledsoe? No, I'm not. My sister always says, oh, yes, he's my husband. <laughs> I don't, but no. There seem to be a lot of unrelated Bledsoe's around. <laughs> Joyce yeah. asked the question. And, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Beth? Yeah, I wanted to ask, because your book, No Stopping Us Now, just was released in April. Are you working on something new that you can kind of share with us a little bit without giving it all away? Well, I can. And you know, you know what an elevator pitch is? You're supposed to be able to say like what you're, and I don't have an elevator pitch yet for my next novel, but it is sold and it's coming out in March. And it also takes place in Oregon, actually. Um, so I, I can't think of a nice way to say it, but um, another one of my obsessions, I have a, I guess if you're a writer, you have to have obsessions is my, oh, shall I say anger with frustration with the religious right um, and what they are doing to this country um, and the um, hypocrisy in what these rightist Christians are calling Christianity, which is so different what I think of Christianity is. So it's a novel that takes my, some characters take them on. <laughs> so that's not a very good elevator pitch. And I actually wrote a note to myself today. I gotta get, I have to say a, a more compelling way to describe this novel, but that's, uh, there's that, yeah. Renaissance woman you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, all over the map. <laughs> all over the map, yes. Well, thank you, Lucy, so much for joining us and uh, sharing your story with us. It has been a remarkable and unique experience, and we really appreciate your being here. Thank I you. enjoyed meeting you all. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Take care.